All right, we are on a series called You Asked For It. The second year in a row we've done this. And what happened is over the Easter um, services, we had a number of services here. And Easter's a great time because everyone shows up. Some people come once a month, twice a month, twice a year, <laughs> whatever. And so everyone shows up on Easter. So it's a great opportunity to give a survey. And what we did is we asked folks, what are the topics you want to hear about the most? And so we took a survey. Over 800 of you took the survey, and we actually compiled it, and we're doing it based upon what you asked for. Thus, you asked for it. And the first week, we had the question, how do I deal with stress? So how many of you are doing better now with stress? Okay, we'll have to do it next year as well. All right. And then last week, we spoke about spiritual warfare, that we are not fighting against flesh and blood alone, but we are in a spiritual war. And if we don't recognize that and we don't understand that, then we're going to be shadow boxing a lot of the time. So I want to encourage you to go back and listen to that. And today really kind of is, is, is today's sermon is predicated on last week's spiritual warfare. And today we're talking about dealing with difficult people. How many people, how many of you guys know difficult people? Let's see, show of hands. Okay. How many of you are the person that's difficult? Let me see a show of hands. Okay, there's about 15% uh, of people here that are honest. The truth of the matter is, you're all difficult. We're all difficult. And that's the beautiful thing about it. None of us are beyond making errors. All of us are difficult at times. And so today we're going to look what the Bible has to say about dealing with difficult people. How do we deal with difficult people? And I want to just back up here for a second and mention a couple of things, okay? First of all, Jesus came to the planet Earth. We all know that the scripture verse, or maybe some of you don't know it, for God so loved the world, right, that he gave Jesus Christ that whoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I did not come to condemn the world, to save the world. The reason why Jesus came, by the way, was not to give us a big book of rules, and how you need to follow these or you're going to go to hell. That's not, that's not the reason Jesus came. He didn't come so we could have a church building. He didn't come so we could have children's program, women's ministries, men's ministries, and helping the poor and all that. He didn't come for that reason. He didn't even come to listen to some guy on stage talking or some gal on stage talking. That's not why he came. He didn't come so we could feed the poor or help the hungry or anything like that. That's not why he came. He didn't come to... For the political party, he didn't come to make a new government. He didn't come to make a new country. He didn't come to make a new church. He didn't come to make a new denomination. He didn't even come to help people. No, didn't come to feed the poor. None of those things. To help the sick, that's not why he came. I don't know if you realize that. None of those reasons are the reasons why Jesus came. You know why Jesus came for? The big R word, relationships. Exactly. The reason why Jesus came was to establish a broken relationship with the people that once had a relationship. It's called humanity. And that's why Jesus came. He didn't come for a church, didn't come for a program, didn't come for anyone for that reason. He came to reestablish a relationship with his creation called mankind. That's why he came. So if we understand that, that everything is based upon relationships. That God created man for mankind for relationships. In the Garden of Eden, they had relationships. They had a strong, powerful, vibrant, growing, and a life-giving relationships. But what happened? Sin came in, missing the mark. And once that happened, relationships were broken with God, and as a result... Relationships were compromised and broken among people. And so why Jesus came is not to get angry at people, not to make a bunch of rules, but to reestablish a relationship with himself so you and I could go to God. And our behaviors and our actions distort, compromise, disintegrate that relationship. And for that reason, he's come. So I hope you understand that. That's a huge, huge difference. If we miss the point of relationship with God, we've missed the whole gospel. It's called good news for a reason. It's not called good news we have more rules. Don't we have enough rules as it is? No, it's about a relationship, not rules. Though, as while we love God, we do better with his various things. And so that being said, that relationships are number, number one in God's priority with him and us. And also, relationships you and I have with each other is essential, especially the church. 
You know, the Bible says that we are called the body of Christ. Body means different parts, comprising the whole. We're called the body of Christ. And so my relationship with my wrist, with my forearm, my forearm was connected to my, how's the song go? I don't remember. Okay, so the, the funny bone's connected to the pastor, whatever. So anyhow, so you have, so you have your hands all connected, right? It's all connected through sinews, through nerve endings, through bones and joints, and it all goes back to the head, and it all communicates with each other, and because my body has a relationship with each other, I can actually move my arms and walk. It's wonderful. But there are diseases out there called multiple sclerosis, for example, where your brain, the, the uh, connection points of your brain uh, have scar tissue on, and then what happens is when you tell your hand to move, it can't do it, and there is a what? A broken relationships between different parts of your body through bad communication and compromising. And as a result, a person cannot do his job. So, understand that God came for relationships with him and with each other. You're called the body of Christ, those that believe in Christ Jesus. And so, we talked about spiritual warfare last week. We talked about the, the enemy's job is to destroy what God's established. Now, if you're the enemy... And the most important thing in the world is relationship with God and humanity and humanity with itself. What's the one thing you're going to attack? Starts with the R. Relationships. Exactly. That's what he's going to do. That's all part of spiritual warfare. And the truth is, relationships are the most wonderful thing that happens to our lives, is it not? What brings the greatest joy to our lives? You could have billions of dollars. And you had no relationships, you're lonely. What do you want? And you, you know, little girls are playing with their dolls, and you know, the princess one day, the boys are cowboys and Indians and blowing things up and then getting a girl at the end. Okay, we all want relationships. We all eventually want relationships. Why do we have children? We want relationships. Relationships is what gives life meaning. Relationships give joy. At the same time, broken relationships bring misery, suffering, difficulty. So you think about it, almost everything we do is hinged on relationships with God and each other. If the enemy can go after our relationships and destroy them, he can pretty much destroy everything else because everything else is built upon relationships. Do you see how important it is? So as a result of that, the enemy would come to sow seeds of discord in a family, in a business, in a community, especially the church. And right now, Right now, you see what's going on in our country. It's the saddest thing I've seen in a long time. I see people riding in the streets and people saying and getting angry at each other and pointing fingers. It's not going to help. I remember in Charleston, South Carolina, that horrible event that took place over a year ago where that crazy gunman came in and shot up that church. Remember that? And then and what happened? They were sitting at a proceeding and they said to the young man, we forgive you. We forgive you. And they were crying. And let me tell you something. It arrested the media. It arrested our country. It was the most powerful thing I've seen in our culture in over 10 years. I'm telling you. Was that not powerful? We forgive you. We forgive you. Wow. What is our country reading right now? We need forgiveness. And I'm praying and asking God, Lord, what can I do? At Cornerstone? What can Cornerstone do to help bring healing to our communities. So I'm going to reach out to some other churches, different ethnicities and different uh, language groups. I'm going to see what we can do to kind of get together and pray and bless, bless each other and say, listen, this is the answer. Because relationships are being broken. And God wants to reestablish relationships, most important, with each other, with him and with each other. So let's look at the Bible and see what it has to say. There is no anxiety like people anxiety. Have you ever had to face a confrontation and it's like someone drop kicked you in the stomach? Oh gosh, I got to face that person today. Oh, I got to face my boss. Oh, I got to face my ex-wife at the ball game. Oh, I have to go to the wedding and I left her 25 years ago as a bad breakup and I have to go see them now. I have to go to the hospital to see the newborn. Or, you know, I have to deal with this person that betrayed me. I have to go back to a funeral and see these people that I can't stand, but I have to go. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Where it's a broken relationship and you have to face it and it's painful. It's painful. 
Broken relationships are extremely painful. There's no anxiety like people anxiety. Make no mistake about it. Make no mistake about it. But I like what the Bible has to say about unity and why it's so important. You see, the enemy understands this. If he can get our unity and break relationships, he can get us totally and holy. That's why it's so, so important we pray for our country, for unity upon our country. And guess what? It's not the politician's um, job. Because God knows the ones we have this year ain't going to do it. You know who the answer is? You and I. How do we start? With, each, with God, each other, right here. And then it goes out. We'll be sharing about today a little bit. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren, which includes women, brethren, to dwell together. It doesn't say for brethren to go to church and uh, have a hip, hip, hurrah time and singing some scripture and going, hey, brother, how you doing? I'm doing fine and wearing a mask and going home. It doesn't say that. It says how blessed it is for brethren to dwell. That means live together, have life together, do life together. Why do we have small groups? So we can learn to do life together. We're trying to create a catalyst and an opportunity to foster relationships. That's where fullness can come. And that's where we can change the world through relationship with God and each other. How blessed and how good and how pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. Not uniformity, but unity. It goes on. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. Okay, the enemy knows this. If they're in unity, God's going to come in the blessing, and there's nothing I can do about it. So let me screw it up. Let me mess up marriages. Let me mess up relationships between um, parents and their children. Let me re uh, mess up a relationship between people in churches and situations. If I can do that, then God can't come in the blessing. And if the blessing isn't there, they're weak and puny. What's the first thing they teach you in? I don't know if they teach us or not, but I'm assuming they do. In Warfare 101, how do you destroy the enemy? You have to... to Blank and conquer. Divide and conquer. That's number one. It's 101. It's basic. I don't know. I never take the course, but I'm assuming it's basic 101. Divide and conquer. That's what the enemy's job is to do. Now, if we understand that, and we understand that God commands a blessing in unity, the Bible says in Ephesians 4 to fight for unity. It is something you have to choose to do. Now, as we look at that, I like what the Bible has to say here. Timothy is a protege of the Apostle Paul, a young man in the ministry, and he begins to give him instruction. And this is what he says. Again, I say to Timothy, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. In other words, don't get involved in politics. Right? Don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments. Why are you going to fight over if you're dunked or sprinkled? Okay, it's got some importance, okay, I suppose. It's seven-day creation or seven time periods. And people are arguing a split church. That's silly. If someone puts a gun on my head and says, was it created in seven days or seven time periods? I'm not going to take a bowl for that. But if it says, Jesus, the Lord of all, I say, yes, he is. I'll take a bowl for that. I'll take a bowl to say the word of God is the word of God. I'll take a bullet that Jesus rose again from the dead, and the only way, the only truth, and the only life is through Jesus Christ. No one comes to the Father except for him. I'll take a bullet for that. But why are we going to argue over secondary issues? It's silly. It's dumb. Don't do it. Do you realize in church history, there was a guy by the name of John Calvin. I grew up Presbyterian, so I can say this. He, he actually drowned the Anabaptist. He said, you want to be, be baptized? We'll baptize you. You're going to never coming up. I mean, that's the stuff they did. There were wars over stupid stuff like that because people had to be right. Relationships. Can I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant. What does ignorant mean? Ignorant means you don't know all the facts. The Bible says in Proverbs, uh, man's opinion sounds good until you get the other side. I I've learned there's three sides in life. There's your side, my side, and the truth. Okay? So in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start Fights, try to avoid fights, don't start fights. A servant of the Lord, now you are a servant of the Lord, I pray you are, must not quarrel, but must be what? Kind. What does it mean to be kind? Well, kind is like, you know, you're in a subway car, you're going to New York City, it's packed out, you're tired, and some older person comes in and you, and you give up your seat to that's being kind. Or, you know, or how about this? It's Christmas Eve. You haven't bought a gift for your spouse. 
and it's going to close in five minutes, and there's a parking space, and someone pulls up there and they cut you. You go, go ahead. That's being kind. A little crazy too, but being kind. <laughs> must quarrel, must, must be kind to everyone, just people that are like me. No, everyone. What does everyone mean? And who's he talking about here? He's pri- you know what the context of this, of this conversation is about? Church people. Everyone. Be able to teach and be patient with? Huh? Difficult people. Do you guys know any difficult people? I know a few. Difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Gently, it doesn't say argue with them and show that they're wrong. No, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Have you ever found being mean and angry ever get you anywhere except for your kids? <laughs> Seriously, if you want to persuade someone, treat them like trash. That will work real good. What does the Bible say? Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change these people's hearts. He's not going to change. If you throw a punch, I'm going to go up like this. I'm not going to, you throw a punch, I'll throw a punch, right? A soft answer turns away wrath. People, perhaps God will change those people's hearts. <laughs> hearts, is it? And they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses. That can happen. The Holy Spirit actually can work in people's lives and escape from the devil's trap. See that? For they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. So you have to establish a relationship. Jesus didn't go to the well and Samarians say, you loose woman, what's wrong with you prostituting yourself around? He didn't say that. You know what he said? Hey, I'm thirsty. I'm gonna give you self-respect. I know no Jewish man would ever speak to a Samaritan woman, but because I see value in you, I'm asking you for a drink. I'm asking something from you. I'm, I'm giving you honor. Then he started a dialogue and a relationship was fostered through respect. Then she was persuaded. But if we go around angry at everybody, it's not going to work. You know, and I know it's real popular to watch MSNBC and Fox News and CNN and all these things and get angry and get veins popping out of your neck and tomorrow we're going to watch this monstrosity tomorrow night. God help us. Okay. I have no, no opinions about what's going on out there. <clears throat> A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, must be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. I want to be in leadership. Okay, you're going to have to deal with difficult people. That's part of the job description. I love, I heard this a number of years ago. I don't know who said it, but I love it. I'll go ahead and read it to you. To dwell above with saints we love that will be such glory but to live below with the saints we know, ugh, that would be a different story. We're all, I mean, we're not in heaven yet, folks. It's not going to be easy. People are going to mess up. People are going to forget to do something. You're going to forget to do something. Someone's going to lose their temper. Someone's going to say something they should have said. And you're going to be offended. You're going to be misheated. You're gonna, bad things are going to be said about you, and you're going to do the same. Guess what? It's time to build a bridge. It's time to get over it. Guess what? All of us screwed up. All of us are full of sin. There's not one that's righteous, not one that's perfect. So can we do something? Can we cut some slack to each other? Cut some slack to yourself and stop the self-attack. This is where it begins, okay? This is all part of it. Now, they did a scientific study that's really profound. I'm going to share it with you in a few moments. The different types of people that you and I encounter in our lives. It was a clinical study by a great man by the name of Pastor Danny Rizzo. And he's a very, very stout pastor. And he did a lot of research. And so I'm going to show you the different types of people that are out there. The first one is the Batman. Okay. The Batman is a vigilante who wears a mask and has a cape. You don't know who he is. You don't know who the real Batman is. He goes, I'm Batman. He talks like that. Okay. I'm Batman. How you doing? Okay, he's got this like, tough thing going on. You don't know what really happens. He has this utility, utilitary belt on. He has all these cool vehicles, and you're not quite sure what's going on. He shows up. He, he kind of deals with situations harshly, and he shows up and disappears. You never know when a Batman is going to show up, and he talks like that. How many people know Batman in your life? 
I know a few Batman in my life. How are you doing, Pastor? I'm doing fine. What's going on? Okay, they talk like that. They're real tough. They got to, you don't know who they are. Is it Bruce Wayne? I don't know who it is. Adam West, who is it? It's the Batman wearing a mask, having a cape. You don't know who that person really is. Oh, how about this? How about the Joker? <laughs> this person laughs at everything. I think the most creepy thing in the world is clowns. Who on earth decided to put clowns in a circus? I was petrified of clowns as a child. Why do they have clowns? Horrible things, right? They laugh at everything. Ah, no big deal. They laugh. They joke about everything. Something happens terrible. They laugh it off. And then they laugh at other people. And then when you're gone, you're wondering, are they laughing about me? Yeah, they probably are. How about that? There's types of people. They're the Batman. There's the Jokers out there. How about this? The Wolverine. The person you think is a normal, everyday person. But boy, you get him ticked off. He'll tear you up, right? He's a Wolverine. And some people know people like that. Where did that come from? Where's this, who's this guy Wolverine? Boy, you give him a moment, he'll tear you up. Well, how about the next one? Iceman. Yeah. There's a group out there called Foreigner that wrote a song about it. You're as cold as ice. Okay? <laughs> These people will come into a room. You can have the best party, the best Christmas thing. You're like, isn't this dinner great? I've had better. I mean, no matter what happens... No matter what happens, they say something cold. You may have the greatest day in church, and you may feel like that Jesus just came on a white horse. And he says, no, he didn't. I mean, just, they ruin everything. They're the Eeyores of life, and they, they make everything cold. You're like, oh, no, they're going to come to Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's coming. I have to see this person once a year, and they're going to make it lousy because they're going to the ice, man. They're always cold, and don't forgive. They give you a silent treatment. How are you doing? And then they do the unpardonable sin. They unfriend you on Facebook. <laughs> Not only do they unfriend you, but they write about it. And then they write a little, you ever see this happen? Someone's upset with you, they start writing things on Facebook that pertain to you, but they don't say it's you. Man, that's cold. That's Iceman. How about Wonder Woman? Oh, yeah, Wonder Woman. This woman gets up at 5 o'clock in the morning, makes her own soap, <laughs> runs a triathlon and pushes a child's baby carriage at the same time, comes to church looking like she just got out of a glamour magazine and she never does anything wrong. Her children are like little ducks and her husband is submissive to whatever she says. How many people know Wonder Woman? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> we all hate Wonder Woman. How about Superman? Yeah, you know who Superman is? He's the guy that always gets one up on you. You're all excited. You finally got a brand new, brand new Cadillac. He buys a BMW. Then you buy a BMW, and he gets an Aston Martin. So no matter what you do, this person will one-up you. You buy a 2,200-square-foot house, he'll buy a 4,500-square-foot house. You have kids in the honor roll, he's got kids going to Yale and Harvard. And so this, this is the guy that always ups you ante, always does more, is always Mr. Right. How many people know people like that? That's frustrating. They irritate you, don't they? Yeah, sure they do. If you know any Superman, don't tell them. How about the Hulk? <laughs> yeah. This is the guy who's like, like kind of small and kind of puny. His name is David Banner. He walks around. I think he's the nicest guy in the world. He's a scientist. He's very smart. You think, wow, this guy, this guy or this woman's got their act together. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden, something happens. And out of nowhere, they completely blow up. And this Hulk, this green thing, they, they break out of their clothes and they destroy everything in your life. You know what I like that? They're called the Hulk? These are passive aggressive types and, until they finally blow up. And then they turn to the Hulk. And finally, my favorite of the whole superhero bunch is Dr. Strange. No reason to say anything more about that. We all know people that are Dr. Strange. They're just weird, okay? And if you're Dr. Strange, you don't know you're Dr. Strange. Okay, these are the types of people the Bible talks about. But how do you deal with difficult people? Okay, here's a revelation. You are a difficult person to somebody. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. How do you know? Because I've talked to them. <laughs> You're a difficult person to somebody. 
I don't care who you are or what you are, someone does not like you. I've learned this, the, the, I've learned a secret to misery, trying to please everybody. No matter what you do, they're going to crucify you. Jesus pro- proved the point. A perfect man, no sin, perfect love, and they crucify. Listen, if they persecuted Jesus, guess what? They're going to persecute you, so get over it. You're going to be hurt. You're going to be offended by people. Get over it. Don't allow it to get to you. You are a difficult person to somebody. How do you know that? Because I know it, because the Bible says it. And by the way, (laughs) the truth of the matter is, you're difficult to God at many times. I disagree with that. I'm the apple of God's eye. I'm sure you are the apple of eye. You're like the punchy punchy eye a couple times. But yeah, you're the apple of his eye, okay. But guess what? You're not always that easy to deal with. How do you know? Because God says it in the Bible. What do you mean? Well, I'll show you. As the scripture says, no one is righteous or perfect. Not even one. Look at your neighbor. Say, you're not one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. And the Bible also says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die. Why we still were what? Sinners. Sinners. You know, you're act together, okay? You're not perfect. You're difficult to deal with. Sin makes things difficult. God had to send Jesus to die on the cross. Do you not think that's difficult? So guess what? You're a difficult person. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a difficult person. But I love you anyhow. Because you love me. And let's sing the Barney song. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Okay, here we go. I love you. Okay, while we are still sinners, the Bible says that. For everyone, 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 everyone means everyone has sinned. We all fall fall short. Some people don't think they fall short. You know what? You do fall short. Even if you're six foot five, you still fall short (laughs) of God's glorious standards. Listen, folks, you're not perfect and you're difficult to God if no one else. All right? No relationship with God or other people will ever work without forgiveness. It just does not work. The reason why you have a relationship with God is because of forgiveness, because Jesus did on the cross. And if you accept that, remember, it's all about relationships. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, listen to this, put on tender mercies, kindness, Humility, I'm being humble, meekness, long suffering. I don't like that one. I can't stand this person. They push all my buttons. Okay, let me tell you something. No one can make you angry. You choose to be angry. No one can drive you crazy. You choose to be crazy. But man, some people make it really easy to go crazy, aren't they? There's some people out there just flat out crazy, aren't they? Sure. They drive you crazy, right? No. You would allow them to drive you crazy. They may give you a lot of material to go crazy with and be upset with, but we have to start taking responsibility. No one makes you angry. You choose to be angry. No one offends you. You choose to be offended. So don't want to hear anything else but that. But you don't know what that, yeah, what do you think they did to Jesus? Okay? So don't blame people for your emotional state. It's your choice. It may be difficult. But it's time we take personal responsibility for our feelings. Because you know what? Feelings, nothing more than feelings. Boy, today's like a little bit of a dancing with the stars with this singing. <laughs> Therefore, as elect of God and, and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, bearing with one another. Forget, listen, I, I'm gonna, you're gonna irritate me, and I'm gonna irritate you. Can we just get over that? Now, is that a license to say, I'm going to be sloppy, agape? No. But can you please make an account and say, you know what? Today, I'm going to be offended by somebody. I'm going to be upset with somebody. Let's get over it and make a decision. We're not going to hold it against each other. What good does it do? Bearing with one another and forgiving one another as what? As God forgave you. If anyone has a complaint against another. Even as what? Christ forgave what? You. You. So you also, if you get around to it and you feel like it, 
That's the Bucci translation that I, that I had to burn. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must. An imperative case in the Greek grammar means a command. You must do. But above all these things, put on love. Which is the, listen to this. You want to be perfect? You want to be Miss Perfect? Mr. Perfect? You know how you become perfect? Which is the bond of perfection. You know, I'm so glad the Apostle Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote something called 1 Corinthians 13. He says, well, if I give my body to be burned, if we build the biggest church in America, and I have four or five jets, I have stadiums, book contracts, and, you know, world dignitaries come to see us, and let's say we, we feed, we wipe out poverty in the state of Connecticut, and we bring such harmony and, and such greatness that there's no one that's suffering, no one, that everyone has something to eat, that this church becomes the utmost of everything. You know what? If we don't have love, guess what it means to God? Zero. Zero. If I lay hands on everyone in here and everyone gets healed, that'd be nice. Right? If I levitate and fly around like the, like the flying nun. I'm really dating myself now. TV land. You know, if you're perfect, if you do everything, you have all the spiritual gifts, if you're a great teacher or philanthropist and you have not love, guess what? God's like, I'm not impressed. You know what God's impressed with? Love. It's the most important thing to do. The Bible says, when I was a child, I acted as a child. I reasoned as a child in 1 Corinthians 13. But when I grew up, guess what I did? I put away childish ways. And how do you put childish ways away? You learn to love. A real man... A real woman that's mature in Christ is a person that loves well. And the only way you can love well is to receive love well, receive forgiveness, love God, and then you love other people. Nothing else matters. I don't care about anything else in this church. I don't care about spiritual gifts. I don't care about being gracious to the poor. I don't care about teaching great doctrine. I don't care about making a difference in society. I don't care if we have 10,000 people on a Sunday morning. You know what? I don't care. You know why? God doesn't care. Because if we don't have love, we're nothing. So, now all those things are great, by the way, with love. So, this is something I've learned through history, being alive a little while. This is what I found out. Sin will complicate your life. And God's love will simplify your life. If your relationships are complicated, there's a sin problem there someplace. If church gets complicated, there's a sin problem. If relationships get complicated, there's a sin problem. Why? Not enough love. Love is the answer to everything. All these things will pass away, but love, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love which is the bond of perfection, my friends. There's nothing more important than loving God, being loved by him, and loving each other, and then taking it out there. There's nothing more important than that. We gotta ask God a question. If someone offends you, you're, if someone drives you crazy, oh my gosh, that person drives me crazy. I just, I don't know. Okay, then that begins to happen. Uh, go to God. I, I've learned to do that. Hey, uh, search me, oh God. And know my heart. God, why, why does this person drive me bonkers for? Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. Don't trust yourself without God. You're not all that in a bag of chips. You're not. You're nothing without God and you're everything with him. You, by the way, by the way, Many people think that they can read people's minds and know their hearts. You don't know people's hearts. You don't. You can get a good idea from their fruit. By their fruit, you shall know them. That's true. But do you have the ability to look into someone's heart? You can't even figure yourself out. How are you supposed to figure other people out? Well, that's what they... How do you know what a person really thinks? There's three, there's three truths, by the way. Their story, your story, and God's truth. So you know what? We need to relax a little bit and search God and ask God to show us anything away. And this is something that I've learned because the Bible says it. How we treat others is how we treat God. Nothing else is a mirror in my relationship with God than how I treat my wife, Sandra. 
This is gonna hurt some of you. I'm sorry to tell you. It's gonna hurt. The truth hurts sometimes, but it will set you free. If I'm not listening to Sandra, I'm not listening to God. Not to saying that she's God, though I think she's a goddess. Seriously. If I'm not getting along with my wife, I'm not getting along with God. How do you, how do you know that? Because she's the closest relationship I have on the planet Earth. According to the Bible, you're going to see it in a few seconds. Selfishness is at the center of you being difficult. The big S word is called selfishness. Me, myself, and I. There's a song out there. I'm not going to sing it. Me, myself, and I. It's called selfishness. The biggest problem in a marriage is not money, it's not sex, it's not communication. The biggest problem in a church or a business or a relationship is not all those things. It's called selfishness. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires that war within you? You want what you don't have. What's that called? Selfishness. You scheme and kill to get it. What causes this? Selfishness. How do you get rid of selfishness? You love God and you love each other. If your relationships are complicated, you have a sin problem. The love of God simplifies your life. It may not be easy, but boy, it simplifies your life. I'm telling you. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get so you fight and wage war to take away. They didn't give me self-respect. They didn't give me that position. They didn't do this to me. They didn't do that. And we have all these things. Yet, don't you, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God. Why are you expecting someone to give you only what God can give you? He doesn't meet my needs. He'll never meet your needs. She doesn't meet my needs. She'll never meet your needs. And by the way, Cornerstone is not going to meet your needs. If you think this church is all that, it's not. You know why? It's full of people. It's full of me, I'm me and it's you. We're imperfect. You're going to get frustrated if you expect others to do what only God can provide. You don't have what you want because you don't ask God. God is the epicenter of everything you need through Christ Jesus and a relationship with him. So you're going to be disappointed with each other. Get over it. Look to God. He forgave you. Let's forgive each other. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Someone said, I love God, but I hate my spouse. Someone says, I love God and hates his brother. And by the way, the context of this is the church. Jesus always starts with him and us and us to the people that we're closest with. And then it goes out from there. That's how the Bible works. It's like throwing a stone in the water. It kind of goes like this. We want to affect the world. The way we affect the world is loving God well, loving our closest relationships well, loving the church well, and then we can export it out there. You'll see it in a few moments. So, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, or sister, by the way, whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Your relationship with God is directly proportional to your relationship with each other, especially those in the faith. Can't get away from it, folks. This is the way it is. And this commandment we have from him, that who loves God must love. It doesn't say if he gets around to it, must love his brother or sister in Christ. We're supposed, we might not like each other all the time. We might get irritated, but you have to make a, a choice and say, emotions, I don't care. You're just emotions. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to listen to the word of God because you know my life's getting complicated. Love simplifies. Sin complicates. Remember that. And above all things, Peter says, have fervent love. How do you have fervent love? By having relationships, by being gracious to each other. Fervent love for what? One another. I don't need to go to church. Listen, so why do we want you to get involved with groups? Because we want you to get to know each other. This is how we grow. You do it here, you do it here, you do it here, you do it here, and we change the world. You can't change the world till you, you and God are right. You can't change the world till the church is right. Listen, we're the answer through Jesus Christ to the world today. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love, oh, I love this one. Love will cover 
a multitude of sins. How many of you could use a cover of a multitude of, of your sins? One of the things I always quote in my house, my kids know I ain't perfect. I just proved it with my grammar. Ain't, by the way, is in a dictionary now. But the truth of the matter is we're not perfect parents. We screw up. But I know our kids know something, right, Luke? You know, you know I love you. And that's what makes us, that's what covers a multitude of sins. Love. What's going to help a church get through a difficult time? Love. What's going to break problems in your life? Love. It's the most powerful force in the universe because love is not an emotion. Love is God himself. Love personified is God. All these other things, I love you, you love me, all that kind of stuff, that, those are just characteristics of God. But God is pure love. And it's the most powerful thing that you and I can do. I want to tell you a story. It's not in my notes. Jack, Dr. Jack Hafer talked about a, uh, a young lady that was, I know this might bother some of you, but get over it. <laughs> Forgive me already. But she was possessed with a demonic spirit. This old lady, older lady, I shouldn't say old, older lady, mature lady came to her and just began to hug her and said, I love you, I love you, I love you. And when she said that, that thing left her. It was the love of God that drove it away. It's the love of God that will heal your mind, heal your body, heal your relationships, heal your marriage. Let's let go and put our hands up, wave our white flags and say, I surrender because I'm not perfect and neither are you, but God's perfect. He forgave me for being a jerk. <laughs> I need to forgive you. It's all part of it, right? Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love. I ask the worship team to get ready, please. Love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. A new commandment I give you. This is Jesus before he left. That you love agape. Agape means loving without strings. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. You treat me nice, I'll treat That's called business. Jesus destroyed business by going on the cross saying, I love you. No strings attached. A new commandment. A new commandment means, you know what a commandment means? A commandment means you have to do it. I give you that you love one another. He's not talking to the outside people. He's talking to the church. Well, that's kind of self-centered. No, it's not self-centered. If you can't do it here, you can't do it out there. All right? So that you love one another as I've loved you, that you also love one another. I'm so thankful for difficult people because difficult people make me grow. I get a little lazy sometimes growing with my character, but difficult people, they bring out the worst in me. They do. And I go, God, you heard, you heard what I just said to my heart. Deal with it. It's a beautiful opportunity. By this, all will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Listen, the answer to everything is not doing more stuff reading more Bibles, helping the poor. That, that's all important. That's all important. But without love, who cares? I, I tell you, if there's no love, I'll pack up, I'll, I'll sell cars. It's kind of fun, actually. That's what I, I seriously, if, this is, if, this, if it's all about rules and regulations and making a difference and me trying to be good to you, trying to be good to me, I'm going to make sure I don't hurt your feelings and if I have to work around all that, forget it. I'll quit tomorrow. But if I love God and love the people he's put it under uh, to me to love, it's a lot easier. Do you see the difference? Love simplifies. Sin complicates your life and my life. If it's possible, as much depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. Now, this is not an unabridged um, sermon about how to deal. There's a lot more we could say about how to deal with, with conflict and difficult people. No doubt about it. But what I will say is this. If we don't have love... Nothing else matters, anyhow. So we got to get this right first. The most important thing that you and I do in our lives is to love God, be loved by Him, love others. How will the world know? Only by what God has done for us. Let's bow your heads, please. Let me ask you a question here this morning. This is the question. I share with you today, and you're going to hear me say it all the time. Jesus didn't die for you to come to church. He didn't die so you could get your act together. He didn't die so you could be happy. He died to save you 
from a collision course with a place called hell of eternal separation from him. The world is on a collision course. And God has sent Jesus to save the world. He sent the church to give that message out. What makes you right with God is not pulling your act together. Let me get some affairs in order first, and then I'll come to God. No, come as you are, where you are. God will accept you where you are. All you have to do is say, I give up. I surrender. Put the white flag. I surrender to God. If you're willing to do that and receive his forgiveness, then today you can begin a new day. Very simple. Jesus died on the cross to pay for all of our sins because you and I have blown it. The Bible says it's not one that's righteous. No, not one. Not, not one person has his act together, but Jesus does. And he loves you and I so much. He wants a relationship with you so bad that he had you come to church today to hear me tell you that because he loves you. God loves you. You're precious to him. So let's pray right now. Every head bowed. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe you died on the cross for me. Thank you for taking my place. I receive your forgiveness of my sins. I ask you to forgive me of everything I know that I've done wrong. And the errors I don't know didn't done wrong, I ask you to forgive me as well. And this day I choose to put my faith in you. I can't save myself, but I know you can. I hand over my life to you. My life is no longer my own. I am yours. Give me the strength now to walk in the path you have for me today. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed, say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. Just say quick show of hands. Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else today? Say, Pastor, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Okay. Look up at me, please. There's a card here. It's called Connection Card. It says, my decision today, I'm committing my life to Christ. If you've never done that today, would you please fill that out? I'm going to ask the, the prayer team to make their way up in a few moments. I'm renewing my commitment to Christ. You can fill that out too. Listen, we want to help you guys out. Come on, everybody. What's the thank you love? What's going on? You know, it's four or five, six people now that made a decision for Jesus. Come on, that's awesome. Listen, we're all in this together, folks. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But you know, together with him, we are perfect. Let's all stand up we could. And let's have a closing prayer about something. Some of you need to have healing in your relationships. I'm going to pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, you have shown us through your scripture undeniably that you desire for us to have a relationship with you through what happens through forgiveness. And Lord, you're asking us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. You're asking us to forgive each other and to walk in forgiveness. We choose to deny our emotions, our inclinations, and we just say to you today, we're going to listen to your word instead of our thoughts and our feelings. And we forgive anyone that has offended us and come against us. And we choose to love and forgive as you've forgiven us. Father, I ask for tremendous unity to be upon this church, upon marriages, upon families. May this be a place where love is so powerful, love is so strong, that people are healed of physical problems, of emotional problems, of relational problems. Father, your love is the most powerful and the most wonderful thing that ever was or ever shall be is your love because your love personified. We receive your love today and we give it to others. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Listen. I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way. We're going to have a, we're going to sing that song, Cornerstone. Let's build our life upon him. We're going to dismiss you officially. We're going to leave this altars open. The altars means the front of the church. We'll love to have you guys come to Grove Track, uh, serve step four. We have some extra spaces and food, okay, and babysitting. So love to have you do that. Okay, let's do it. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. One more time, come on, set it up. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. 
worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i worship your holy name amen may the love of god and the fellowship of each other be with you always god bless you let's walk in his peace and his grace amen everybody God bless you. The altars are open for prayer. Listen, we want to pray with you. God bless you.